Teresa Stewart Ambo and Kalu Fox are the co-directors of the Indigenous Futures Institute at the University of California, San Diego. Kay Wayne Yang is a critical theorist and social critic who writes about popular culture, social movements, urban education, critical pedagogy, decolonization, and many other subjects. Stuart Ambo and Fox are two authors with wildly divergent research interests. Fox does work in genomic research and is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, affiliated with the Department of Anthropology, while Stuart Ambo is an assistant professor in the Education Studies program at UC San Diego. Despite these distinct research focuses, they co-direct the Indigenous Futures Institute with a visionary sense of collective purpose for the Institute to signify beyond the individual demands of each member's disciplines. IFI is exceptional for the projects that are being worked on there, but it's also important because it is indigenous run at the highest level. This is not something that we encounter very much, and certainly not enough. The Institute is about imagining indigenous design hubs outside of the constraints of, as Yang explains, the nation state, because that social formation and its obsession with borders cannot grasp the vital nature of living in interconnected bioregions. When I asked Yang in this conversation about what demilitarization could mean from an, an indigenous perspective, he didn't talk about any one conflict, but instead focused on the land and the context of a total war on nature, and how this language of interconnected bioregions allows us to think in radical ways about demilitarization beyond the removal of troops. I asked them about a number of topics and start this conversation by asking about the question of co-optation, whether decolonization as a language has been reduced to gestures. Fox talks about his feeling that indigenous ideas are being used as a kind of ornament, which is especially galling when we consider the ongoing callous disregard for indigenous lives in the name of scientific progress, so-called. Fox makes it clear that he's come to believe unapologetically in the vertical control of technologies putting indigenous people, as he says, in charge of their data. He stresses how indigenous data sovereignty can be combined with large-scale land-back initiatives by making sure that indigenous communities maintain control of their own intellectual property. While there is a discursive shift among critical people toward decolonization in the form of land acknowledgments, Stuart Ambo talks about how universities are still clearly not structured with indigenous prosperity in mind. She argues that so much of the language around equity, diversity, and inclusion is about diversion and either overlooks indigenous peoples or actively plays into stereotypes. She demands respectful engagement at the highest levels and wants land acknowledgement statements to materialize relationships with institutions actually stepping up and doing their part. No more superficial land acknowledgements, Fox says, because they are so obviously functioning as a form of misdirection as a way of distracting the public from the persistence of privatization, extraction, and harm done to indigenous communities. What is so different then about the Indigenous Futures Institute from their perspective, and I'm starting to see as an outsider how stark this difference is from the ways in which people are taught in the traditional Eurocentric university, what's so different is perhaps embodied by this idea of dream tanks, in direct opposition to the notion of think tanks where, as Yang puts it, we're told how to think rather than giving given time and space to explore what may be thought. Fox talks about the idea of a futurist fluency against the nightmare scenarios that we face under settler colonial capitalism, and gives us this incredible vision for a moment where, in the husk of colonialism, communities can make something beautiful, innovating out of the remnants of militarism and industrialization. It feels appropriate to do a sort of land, land acknowledgement, even though I hope part of the conversation will be uh, to engage with the problematic politics of land acknowledgements. You know, I'm speaking from you from Chibuktuk, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people, um, and and you know, from a university, Mount Saint Vincent, that has direct ties historically with this genocidal system of residential schools in Canada and an institution that has only just recently apologized for that role in ways that were necessarily problematic and unfinished. Um, but there's an attempt at least to deliver on um, the sort of promise or prospect of decolonization. Um, and you know, at this university, uh, we just recently hosted Catherine McKittrick, who's a phenomenal African-Canadian um, you know, critical race theorist. 
And, um, you know, she, you know, after her, her talk, which was incredible, um, I asked her if she struggled at all with, because, you know, one of, part of her work is just struggling with the colonial institution of the university. Um, you know, I asked her if she struggled with basically like giving away these concepts that might, as she put it, accumulate and dispossess black people um, by equipping white academics like myself with um, a critical framework that might accidentally reinscribe the sort of authority of white speech in the university. Um, you know, this is something that Wayne, you and Eve Tuck have, have called like the innocence move of academic institutions where there's this like mastery of the terms that then allows those that are complicit to appear blameless, basically. Um, so I guess like to all of you, I wanted to ask sort of a version of that question. Um, you know, in what ways do you struggle as indigenous scholars and public intellectuals with this specific dilemma? Like, are you constantly conscious of the risks of co-optation and how do you counter it? So I'll break the ice on that. Um, I, I mean, I think that, uh, Certainly, we always struggle with the issue of co-optation with the any activities in university, whether it be sort of the production of terms and ideas that then can be reused and recycled, and the meanings can be um, domesticated and assimilated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll just say, like, even with um, you know my writings with Eve Tuck, I. I think that she always had a vision they would be read widely. And, um, you know, she's really quite a revolutionary thinker. Um, but I, I think that those, um, I think that sometimes even, let's say, decolonization is not a metaphor. That phrase is used almost as like a, a cursory nod to the concept mm -hmm. that things are problematic and then people move on. Mm -hmm. So so I think it happens. But at the same time, that is that is part of the struggle, right? And I think that part of the struggle is it's never been a pure struggle. It's always been one of co-optation and complicity and vice versa that we are trying to also <laughs> en enlist the resources or people or infrastructure of the university to do certain things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we can talk about it more also beyond words, which is uh, what are some of the efforts that Indigenous Futures Institute, for example, is doing that um, always risks co-optation. Um, we could go there if we wanted. Yeah, well, that's definitely where I was going to go next. Uh, but does anyone want to kind of add to that? Yeah, could I add? Yeah. Yeah, I would add that, you know, uh, kind of like what Uncle Wayne's alluding to, this idea that people will co-opt your ideas in, in a superficial way it's like window dressing or some sort of ornament that you put on a christmas tree but it's not the actual authentic version of where your ideas are coming from because we're talking about thousands of years of heritage and culture so once uh, a friend of mine and a bunch of indigenous scholars published a paper in the journal Nature about ethical frameworks for enhancing relationships with indigenous people in the genome sciences. And this paper gets referenced a lot, but it actually gets referenced in this superficial way. It's not that they actually adhered to the guidelines or the frameworks that we presented. It's just that they window dress in the end of a discussion section where they've extracted indigenous people's genomes and appropriated our information. So we're weary of that, even though it brings us academic currency. Mm. Um, but that's not what we do here, you know, and that actually is the motivation for a lot of counter technologies and safeguarding technologies and um, new directions. So <clears throat> all of that is to say that that sort of window dressing and artificial approach forces us and motivates us and inspires us to dig deeper to protect our community's interests and empower them. Mm. Yeah, there's like a restlessness about it. Um, and I, I think that concept of like extracting knowledge um, is is pretty incredible. Um, Teresa, did you want to chime in too? Yeah, yeah. I think where you where you left off is like exactly where I wanted to pick up. Um, being an Indigenous person um, who studies higher education, um, 
and, and you know understands the colonial or settler colonial nature of these institutions. Um, I think we come to understand that it is predicated on extraction and exploitation and that these institutions were really never made for us and that their inhospitability is, um, you know, it's, it's by design, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I'll speak from my experience, um, uh, having attended a university that's squarely situated within my homelands I'm always engaging with my communities and and doing research for our prosperity that often contradicts um, what what narratives the institution is upholding. Um, you know, it. I I have to recognize that you know I'm I'm holding multiple tensions at the same time. Um, a lot of indigenous, well, I guess not very many, but the indigenous people who are drawn into the academy. Um, I think we recognize that when we we're inhabiting a space that it it really hinges on our erasure um, and it's really not made with our prosperity in mind and so we always have to really compromise these incongruities right Mm -hmm. um and and I, i think that ifi the institute that we developed together we're really leaning into the hopefulness um, that we have in co-creating with communities. And we're really trying to salvage from all of these contradictions, resources and opportunities to really forward futures that we and our communities determine are important for them. Um, So yeah, co-optation is always a concern. It's always a risk that we have, but I would say the work is more important um, within the last month, I've seen our institution um, co-opt some of the efforts that we are engaging with um, through our institute. And, I, you know, at, at many times you have to put that aside and recognize that the work is more important than the matter of, or than it being co-opted by the university. So that's kind of how I would answer your question. Yeah. Hey, can I add one more thing? For sure. You know that quote from um, the one of the greatest guitarists ever, Prince, who's pimping who? <laughs> That's how we roll. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, wow. <laughs> I don't know how to riff on that necessarily, but I love it. Um, you know, I like, I immediately think of your, your sort of uh, interventions around like just benefit sharing, like trying to ensure that the benefits of knowledge production in this case are, are shared. Like, and, and Teresa, your you're writing on just like the practical solutions that are that are available if if the institution is is willing not to just kind of like modestly reform itself but actually revolutionize itself in certain ways um, is 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 so insightful like you know just you talk about onboarding and training and how these things might seem like boring or insufficient but like you just point out like those practices don't exist at colleges and universities and are necessary for establish. I'm quoting you for establishing more robust procedures of re-education and engagement. And, and I mean, yeah, decolonization is not a metaphor stresses that the quote front loading of critical consciousness building can waylay decolonization, even though the experience of teaching and learning to be critical of settler colonialism can be powerful or so powerful it can feel like it's making change. So, I mean, like, that thing of trying to salvage from the contradictions and, and dwell in the kind of like messiness of all of it um, is what I'm hearing. And just and and I'm also hearing just that you have a really developed sense, all of you, of like the pitfalls of professionalization in some sense. Like once these discourses, these terms get codified, um, something gets gets lost. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is I guess where I wanted to go. It's like what then is is fundamentally different. Um, about IFI, the Indigenous Futures Institute, um, you know, like uh, Wayne, in your uh, co-authored editor's introduction to the Indigenous and Decolonization Studies and Education series from Routledge, you write about how the last two decades have seen this kind of professionalizing in some sense of um, decolonizing studies, right? So doctoral and master's programs in Native American, American Indian, Maori, Aboriginal, Native Hawaiian, and Alaska Native uh, studies have been established in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, a bunch of journals have been founded. Um, there's all this exciting work being done, but it seems to me that there's something still different about the way that the Indigenous Futures Institute is imagining, like, for example, the purpose of dream tanks. I love this, this 
term, you know, that seems com- completely sort of singular of, of dream tanks as an alternative to think tanks. Um, could you speak to, I guess, that that kind of concept and how maybe it 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 does dwell restlessly in the professionalizing space sort of of the university? We're um, inspired and actually got that term from from a colleague of ours, Luana. Mm-hmm. And I love that idea. I mean, I think a lot of times what happens in the genomics world, I was just writing about how Henry Kissinger just decided to move forward with Operation Bravo in the Pacific. And he famously quoted, what's 90,000 people, you know, who gives a damn, right? Hmm. And that just is a blatant disregard of human life, indigenous lives in the Pacific uh, in favor of kind of scientific progress, quote unquote. And that to me, though, and then there's all these unintended consequences of that, like large scale policy policy decision, right? And this happens all the time in different spaces like CRISPR Cas9 or gene drives or synthetic biology, where we're not really forecasting what the unintended consequences are. We're not painting and creating every single decision tree to understand what the possible impact is of the deployment of new technologies. And they're often tested in indigenous places, places that have shaped our genomes over time, places that we have close affiliations with that are sacred to us. So when we dream about the future, it should be an indigenous one that's empowering for our communities, not leaving us with transgenerational legacies of cancer and decimated soil and reefs. Um, as a result of all types of forms of militarism and colonialism. So what Mm -hmm. we're trying to do in many different ways is understand what the nightmare scenarios are and what the actual dreams that empower us in the future are. So that teaching and creating that fluency around being a futurist is really important. You know, creating the next generation of like, (laughs) of I don't know, fortune tellers in our communities is really important. But I guess my colleagues probably want to add too. Yeah, I, I would add um, something that I really love about the Indigenous Futures Institute and what we are doing together is that we're bringing together multiple disciplines. Um, we're taking a trans-Indigenous approach. Um, we're bringing in colleagues um, who are really committed to and anti-colonial and decolonial research and community engagement efforts in a very practical way um, to really create a lot of the work and the initiatives that we're doing with the institution. Um, and, you know, also, you know, recognizing, um, and Scott, you mentioned this in your opening, right, the, the legacy of a lot of these institutions and how they're entangled and complicit and complacent, complacent with um, colonialism, right? They've had they've had um, very direct relationships or roles in harm done to indigenous youth, indigenous communities, dispossession and displacement, and as a result, disenfranchisement. And I think that our institute is uh, trying to, as best we can, redress some of the harms that our institutions have done in indigenous communities and trying to recast these relationships. And one way we're trying to do that is by working with the communities um, that we desire to work with or that desire to work with us. Um, We're really pushing and trying to move in a direction where we're doing community engaged work or community driven work where it's shaped and informed by what the community actually wants and actually desires. Um, and so I, I do think that's something that's especially special and unique about IFI. Um, there are a lot of universities, a lot of institutes, and a lot of centers that are doing um, similar work, um, and, but we are taking a bit of a different approach. Um, one of those approaches is through these dream tanks, and Keola mentioned uh, Luana Richmond. She, um, she's an Afrofuturist, and she, in one of our first meetings, when we were talking about approaches and conversations, um, uh, Luana gave us this idea of dream tanks as opposed to think tanks. Um, And really 
articulated to us that exclusive nature of a think tank, right? And assuming who can be a part of these conversations based off intelligence. And I think that really resonated with me and with us in a way, um, because Indigenous people have been cast as unintelligent, right? Um, it, that is one of the apparatuses of settler colonialism is to uh, really dismember Indigenous people in many ways, but one of them is through this intellectual dismemberment of, of, of casting them as inferior um, or unintelligent people. And the idea of a dream tank was really appealing because it said, you know, regardless of your intelligence, your age, your gender, your background, everybody has something that's valuable to contribute. Everybody's able to dream up future possibilities for themselves and their communities. And, uh, you know, it really takes us away from this idea of thinking and intelligence and cognition to a place where everybody can be a part of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's not just reproducing like the power of the institution as, as such, like this is the, the language of the dream tank, right? On, in your mission statement, it's, you say it's about dreaming up abundant and pl plentiful indigenous futures in an age of climate crisis, global pandemics, and the continued denial of indigenous sovereignty. It's like precisely not about looking at the future as something that is just a perpetuation of the violence of the present. It's not this foreclosed thing, um, you know, which is so endemic to like neoliberal uh, thinking, right? Um, and Wayne, I wanted to kind of bring in something that you write in A Third University is Possible, uh, this incredible short book from, I think, the Forerunner series. You asked, like, how can colonial schools become disloyal to colonialism? Um, and you seem to connect that to the need for, quote, a critical discourse about boarding schools as part of a policy of cultural genocide. Um, you know, when I was reading that, I was reminded of the book uh, Red Nation Rising, uh, Nick Estes, Melanie As Yazzies, and, uh, and others' text about um, border towns, but in general, these kind of, these the multiplication of borders, right? And the racist boarding school being itself this kind of border space of, of unfreedom. Um, and they talk about how, you know, that that violence was experienced and passed on intergener intergenerationally and, and how like there has not been like the same level of reckoning in relationship to that system of sort of pedagogical destruction in the United States compared to what we've seen recently, at least in Canada. Um, so like, you know, in Canada, the tally of, for example, unmarked graves that have been discovered through technology so far as you know, First Nations across the country conduct these radar searches um, at these school sites have sort of shocked the public, which demands, it seems, this data, despite, you know, the confirmation of, of these graves coming as no shock to the Indigenous peoples of Canada. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear you, Wayne, sort of, you know, think, to hear what you think about this particular moment in, in Canada and whether you've kind of followed um, the shock that has surrounded um, this particular moment. But also, you know, I wanted to gesture, Teresa, to your article, We Can Do Better, University Leaders Speak to Tribal University Relationship, where you talk about, you know, settler colonial education physically removing Indigenous people from their homelands and, and what it means to, like, actively redress that by making these colonial schools more hospitable to the specific you know, dreams and intelligences of, of Indigenous students. Um, so, I mean, either of you could jump in there, but um, be, be curious to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, well, thank you for raising that. I mean, first, uh, you know, we're learning so much from uh, Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, um, you know, treaty uh, tribal folks up in um, Canada and, and really learning from their scholarship activism, um, me, you know, forms of, uh, of memory as, um, as a site of, of resistance, but also of, um, bringing about the futures that were always meant to be. So, so just a lot of respect to that work and don't claim to be an expert, although certainly we're, we're, we're learning and listening carefully. Um, I think in terms of the United States, uh, in particular, not reckoning, but, in, and also our, um, our particular location in California is really fascinating because 
there's a way in which California and the West Coast of the United States is always narrated as somehow not part of chattel slavery, not part of colonization, not part, you know, it's, it's the left coast, so to speak. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is kind of this, um, in, a, in a sense, like a primitive accumulation using that Marxist term, you know, how Marx sort of got around colonialism by coming up with this idea of primitive accumulation that somehow this all took place before and now we have capitalism and it's actually mm-hmm. always taking place right and and it's the accumulation and extraction that's taking place by naming certain people as primitive or naming certain things as nature or resource or those kinds of things and california is very much that way in terms of history so so california benefits from from the the histories of colonization and empire um in manifest destiny, but also Spanish and Mexican periods of California, which which California names as its origin story, but at the same time can be sort of distant from it to not have to claim responsibility for the atrocities. And so I, I think that similar to uh, boarding, we have boarding schools in California as well. So, but similar to the boarding school period, the, the mission period is very, very recent. And, and that really is a period of genocide in the name of education. And those and those graves are basically not counted or accounted for, even though they are enumerated. And um and we um you know our our teachers in California still teach the mission project, even though it's fallen out of favor, you know, teachers are just trained in that and they really like it because you know you can make things out of marshmallows and it's hands-on and and um I went to the California Indian conference uh you know it's been a few years now where where they were, you know, people were, t- indigenous people, California Indians um, were talking about what it means when their own kids have to do the mission project in public schools. And they always tell them, well, if you're going to build a mission, you better lay aside a really large area for a cemetery. And I, I think that it's really not accounted for. And it's also, um, there's a way in which there isn't even acknowledgement that the missions are connected to boarding schools, are connected to our public schools, are connected to our universities. Um, so, so I, I think that the counting is yet to come. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll hand it off to Teresa who can, I think, uh, has probably something much more intelligent, but also practical to say around this in terms of um, where we might be engaging. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Um, you know, with, with you mentioning the missions in California that started in 1769, right? Um, I'm reminded of a conversation I had yesterday um, with my sister about how you know cities um, adopted names of the missions, um, but also how the UCs adopted these names and thinking about this continuum uh, of the mission and how it is um, rooted in a way in the in the UC system. Um, and so it was just like an interesting observation we both had. Um, I'll, I'll answer your question, Scott from from a particular point that um, I've been really thinking about lately because I am working on or finalizing and today we're actually sending a paper out for review to our community members on the history of the land that UCLA occupies. Um, And it's really been a wonderful project uh, to work on with my sister um, in rewriting this narrative that is relatively public. Um, You know, it's, uh, I think, uh, Tristan... Um, Antone and Bobby Lee write in their um, article in High Country News, um, you know, this this narrative is hiding in plain sight, um, but Native people or Indigenous people haven't been woven into it. Um, and mm-hmm. so that's something that we're trying to do. And so it relates to your question around um, it, the, the inhospitability, inhospitability of these institutions. Um, and and for me, um, in the research that we do and what we're trying to accomplish with IFI is one, create <clears throat> safety zones, or you know, I guess um, some scholars call them like these sacred zones within institutions that protect and provide, provide space for indigenous people within the institution to exist. Um, you know, and and be protected from a lot of the harm of the university. Um, in my work in particular, what I'm interested in is like, how do we move institutions in very practical ways um, to engaging Native nations in a respectful way? Um, and it really comes out of my experience being an Indigenous person, um, a Tongva woman at UCLA and UCLA being on my homelands. 
Um, it comes from working in student affairs and, and hearing these initiatives around equity, diversity, and inclusion, either overlooking Indigenous people or, you know, really playing into tropes and stereotypes and making assumptions. Um, it also comes from working with university leaders and that and recognizing that they really had no knowledge, but also no understanding of what respectful engagement looks like. Um, and so what I try to do in the work and I try to do in practice with IFI is uh, engage in respectful ways or push our institution to think of engagement with indigenous people in respective way, respectful ways, but more so um, how are we engaging communities in ways that are not mutually beneficial, in ways that actually foreground the needs and the desires and the hopes and the futures of those indigenous communities. Um, and it's a constant struggle. Um, it feels like with every step forward, we take um, sometimes 10, 10 steps back. Um, <clears throat> but I think that that's one of our, our goals as an institute, but also I think that's one of our inherent goals as indigenous people within this institution is leveraging spaces and resources and changing perspectives if even if it's one single degree for our for the betterment betterment of our communities and really putting our careers secondary um which you know that's a that's a tension that um is is discussed i think very often in ind indigenous education I think it it connects to your uh your your stirring and really vivid article uh that you titled Dear Native Students with Love. Um and just like even that title like it reminds me of the Red Nation podcast uh this week is focused on like indigenous perspectives on on love uh which I'm excited to listen to but just like framing it in terms of like an act of love like love is sort of like a kind of selfless thing. Um, you know, the whole article is about trying to kind of situate yourself in relationship to um, this this stolen land that you you arrive early on the campus and you experience it emptied of this kind of business and activity. And then you see it kind of descended on by, you know, all of these professionals and you feel suddenly, you know, displaced by that by that moment of it being suddenly populated by all of this activity. Um, and, and like just the way that you describe your experience at UCLA in that article, you know, talking about how you feel like you lack, lack the simple skills of like studying, note taking and time management. Like it's this, it's this kind of almost confessional piece that ultimately is about how you were, as you put it, galvanized by um, being being dismissed by the university um, and, and like, you know, kind of like deciding to kind of re, you know, uh, to apply and then kind of recommit in certain ways. But like the thing that the reader takes away from that is that there just was not support at all, um, that you had to seek out this support. And this is certainly something that we see, especially among international students here at the Mount, um, that in many ways they're not supported adequately. Um, and so like that that idea of trying to push for the university to be a more hospitable space, like, you know, and, and specifically more hospitable to indigenous epistemologies as like a core part of the curriculum. Um, you know, I'm curious to hear you speak about the way that you apply this like methodology of tribal crit to that sort of imagining um, against like settler violence and exclusion and displacement. And whether I guess if you've as indigenous scholars had to like deal with a certain compulsion, I guess, to almost like overcompensate for and because of the kind of racism of the university and the epistemologies and languages and discourses that it like that it celebrates. I'm going to go very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott, thank you for reading um, some of my work. I always wonder who the heck reads this stuff <laughs> and, um, you know, whether it's resonating with anybody. And so I really appreciate your take on that article, uh, Dear Native Students, um, because it, it did come from a place of love. Um, and uh, in my own experience, I think in all our experiences, um, either as students or as uh, faculty, you know, you see this incredible neglect that Indigenous students and Indigenous communities are experiencing within the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just say uh, to your question about overcompensation, I think that as Indigenous people, and for me as an Indigenous woman, like we are conditioned, um, and it's a byproduct of settler colonialism to 
um, be made to felt to feel like we aren't enough. Um, and so like, you know, my automatic conditioning for a class, for a lecture, for a podcast is to over prepare. Right. Um, right. Instead of writing uh, four articles a year or two articles a year, which my department ex- expects, I'm writing seven. Um, right. And so that's a tension that we're constantly grappling with. And I also think that speaks to um, being a first generation college student faculty is also learning um, what is often hidden from us. Right. Um, but I think to the question about tribal critical race theory, um, for me, I'm I'm really I, I'm a huge proponent of using frameworks that exist um, and, you know, using I, I know that in academia, there is this huge push to create your own frameworks. And um, I, I really like to draw from other indigenous scholars um, and the frameworks that they're using or they've created to help um, help me think about things. Um, and so that's the use of tribal critical race theory in my work. Mm-hmm. Um, tribal crit was uh, written um, or was conceptualized and written by Brian Brayboy, who's a mentor of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also really extremely tired of using uh, theories that are non-Indigenous um, or by non-Indigenous scholars. And so I really try my best to use frameworks and theories that were developed um, by Black, Indigenous uh, scholars of color. Um, and so that that's also another reason why I use c- tribal critical race theory. But tribal co- critical race theory borrows from multiple disciplines. And for me, it's really helped me interrogate the institution from an indigenous lens, um, right? right? Because for far too long, indigenous people have been examined and interrogated and, and I'll use the word again, dismembered by white uh, paradigms and frameworks and theories. And so for me, uh, tribal critical race theory is the opportunity to really flip the script um, and use an indigenous perspective and a theory at that by an indigenous scholar to really interrogate the harms um, and the injustices that exist within the institution. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, Kielo, your research is about like a kind of like literal physical dismemberment of history, a destruction of the artifacts of history that is prim- pr- primarily profit driven, like you you say pretty, pretty explicitly. Um, and it's interesting, like in that article that I mentioned, uh, Teresa, you write about the, the protests against this 30 meter telescope that I know, um, Kielo, you've also written this co-authored piece with uh, Chanda Prescott Weinstein about. Mm. Um, and I wondered if you could, if we could use that sort of segue as a, as a means of like thinking about indigenous technology, right? Like this, this because you know, I've, uh, I interviewed Melanie Azzi for the podcast, and and they write in the mm-hmm. Red Deal that quote, science and technology have have never been at odds with indigenous life ways, but capitalism's monopoly turned extraction basically into the only mode of doing things like this seems to be at the the heart of your sort of approach to rethinking genomic research anthropology you know i know that you you appeared on the native stories podcast and sort of talked about this like um at one point you talked about how uh uh, engineering in most indigenous technologies is place-based and invisible to the casual onlooker uh because the kind of cosmology of settler colonialism is about you know, not optimizing the space for abundance and, and sustainability, but just like extraction and the production of profit. D- to what extent are you like theorizing technology when you do your research? And to what extent is it more about the sort of like, again, just like material practices that need for you to be clearly like better regulated in order to prevent harm to indigenous communities? Like, do you, how do you balance theory and practice? I guess is maybe a way of thinking about it. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I, I think like one of the kind of guiding forces uh, for me for for this and a lot of the ideas and things we've talked about uh, amongst, you know, with Uncle Wayne and Teresa and I is this idea of like taking these kind of indigenous ways of knowing knowledge systems, local contextual place based knowledge systems. And that's like a distinct element. And then recombining that with another distinct element, which is a, a Western 
you know, profit driven, extractive driven technology, like something like uh, artificial intelligence or remote sensing or genome editing, and then recombining them to create a new alloy in, in service of our communities. I guess I was trying to ask questions about how this, this idea that, you know, there's an assumption that indigenous technologies are completely, you know, uh, divorced from contemporary tools and kill like your research is is about creating this alloy as you put it um that that you know doesn't ignore either uh, uh as it were sort of life world and trying to create you know things that benefit actual communities but also open onto a future that isn't just this like endless doom scrolling in the face of wildfires and, <laughs> and rising sea levels right like mm -hmm. um so specifically in relationship to genomic research, which I, I'm not by any means well versed in, you know, it's this idea that, as you pointed out, that uh, uh, genomes themselves, that you can see in the genome, the impact of, of violence and genocide and European colonization. And you're like rejecting some of these ideas, like the, the Jared Diamond, like gun germs and steel argument. And instead saying that, like, I think you said in, in the Native Stories podcast, it's germs, germs, and germs, mm -hmm. that it's about like, you know, this form of life shaping us in ways that we're not masters of, right? Um, and I guess, like, could you expand then on the way in which, like, a Eurocentric understanding, for example, of genocide as sort of a population bottleneck doesn't do justice to that apocalyptic event and, like, how there are uh, um, evidence of human genetic variation that, you know, doesn't, it isn't just purely scientific, but it is also cultural and about stories and about, you know, um, you know, living on. Yes, that's a, a, a great distillation of some of our, our new work here. Thinking about the impact of colonialism on the genomes of Indigenous people. And it feels good to say that in 2022, because that's something that we can empirically identify Instead of using a term like bottleneck to discuss, you know, the arrival of a certain population or something like this, you can actually determine with really accurate sensitivity the timing and the arrival of something like Cook or Cortez and how that has caused the population collapse, to borrow a term from Jared Diamond, and how that leads to what we see as an impact in gene regions that are really associated with inflammation and the root cause of most common complex diseases. So rather than like basing every theory and narrative that comes out of the science of, of our genomes, and these are genomes that are not interpreted by our people, um, it's really dangerous because it, it just points to like the, the dire and basically shitty health state of a lot of indigenous communities as something that's innate and not something where you've separated communities from their traditional health systems and the ways that they've sustainably cultivated land over time, the exact same land that shaped our genomes over time. And you point to it being some uh, genomic issue. And so we're trying to really piece apart a lot of those relationships and mm -hmm. use that data to disentangle that and really say this idea of colonialism, it is a cultural force that has shaped our genomes, something like the human leukocyte antigen, for example. But that's, that's kind of a, a basic philosophy for the way we think about things here at IFI. Right. And I mean, like, so in terms of, again, like kind of picking up on this idea of creating a blend of technologies like so you're 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 steeped in all of this like knowledge of genomic research and and you say like it has the potential to impact also the politics of indigenous rights and specifically how you think about the history of the land uh, uh, and belonging um, but you're also talking about these health applications so like um you have an article in scientific american where you write that you've just begun to or we as a society have just begun to develop these path-breaking mRNA vaccine-based therapies um, that have already shown their ability to, quote, save the world. 
Given their success and potential, you say, why not design treatments such as gene therapies that are population specific and reflect the local complexity that speaks to indigenous people's uh, unique migratory histories and experiences with colonialism? But so like beyond just sort of the work that you're doing to to kind of innovate in across these like two two worlds that have evolved for thousands of years discreetly, you're now trying to bring technologies together. You're also doing the work of like communicating that research, which I think is really interesting. So like you're a National Geographic Explorer, I think they call it, you know, there, you've, you're, you have a TED talk. And I wondered like how you think about the kind of politics of knowledge translation in some ways, like you're very much marketing in some sense, like these, you, they could be called technocratic solutions to issues that are still like you're, you're, you make clear representative of our profound entanglement with the non-human world like when you participate in these acts of knowledge translation, do you think of it as like strategic in some ways? Um, like when you did TED, was it about the kind of, in a, in a way, the prestige? And do you also see value in the ways that those media simplify complex ideas and make them like bridgeable for people? Yeah, that's a great question. I went into that whole TED talk scenario with an agenda and that agenda was to alert the rest of the world that the vast majority of genome studies are on white people, howlis, and that if we're painting a picture for the future of medicine and the deployment of these technologies, um, it's not really having an impact in our community's health. And then there was another statistic that I wanted to get. So everything was crafted, you know, any type of propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one was that 95% of clinical trials exclusively feature white people. And to me, I wanted to situate ourselves in a way where we're pointing to those numbers and we're saying those solutions, they're not helping us. And there are systematic reasons why, which I pointed to. And then there are sort of these historical reasons was hap which happened to do really with distrust because of extraction and genocide and racism and colonialism and nepotism and all of the tisms. However, I think now my position has matured to where I believe in vertical control of technologies. And I believe in putting indigenous people in control of our data. So with the arrival of indigenous data sovereignty, energy sovereignty and large scale land back initiatives and all of those things lead to healthier communities and healthier aina and i think that's a really really important distinction with regard to targeted treatments i don't just mean we're having treatments that are more effective for our communities as we begin to apply mrna for cancer and heart disease and autoimmune disorders and a range of things I mean that our communities are in control of the intellectual property, the royalties that are reaped from the development of new technologies, and we're able to buy back more of the land that was stolen from us, that exact same land that shaped our genomes again. And that is poetic. To use that IP to further create circular economic systems. So in that sense, it's really intertwined with everything that Uncle Wayne and Teresa are doing, because once we have control of those systems, then we have a certain way that we go about educating our communities and acknowledging that space and empowering our future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it. To connect it to, um, you know, Wayne, in your, in your book at Third University is Possible, you talk about uh, the dirty work of being a so-called cyborg with an S, uh, uh, so, you know, a, a being that g gains its agency from these sort of connections to networks. I see, Kilo, your work as being kind of like this, this dirty work, right, of making these calculations. Um, Wayne, you write, nothing is too dirty for cyborg dreaming. MBNA or MBA programs, transnational capital, Department of Defense grants, cyborgs are ideology agnostic, which creates possibilities in every direction of the witch's flight, this concept in the book. So it's like this idea of sort of abandoning a certain almost like political purism in order to just tactically decolonize materially in the present, like this, this thing of like getting a certain kind of poetic justice by just like repossessing 
intellectual property in the form of both data and, and, and the actual material artifacts and so on. Could you speak to maybe Wayne, to put it flatly, whether you see the kind of work that Kalu does as the work of the cyborg in some sense? Oh, yeah, I think Kalu is super cyborgian, but <laughs> I, I think this is a good time to maybe think about IFI more broadly too, like Indigenous mm-hmm. Futures Institute. Kalu and Teresa are the co-directors, and we also have um, Emmanuel Suarez Carrillo, who's Spanish, and he's an architect, and uh, Sarah Ahrens, who is an uh, Alaska native, and she is an atmospheric scientist. It's very, very interdisciplinary, and in some ways, like, we're all engaged in our own kind of dirty aspects of, of our disciplines, but, but I think the synergy and the, and the goal of being collectivized is to be able to have a collective purpose that exceeds kind of like the demands of our disciplines to just do, do dirt. Right. And Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, with Kalu and Teresa, you know, they're, they're really an amazing pair as co-directors because uh, (laughs) Teresa has this line where she says, you know, Kalu is the lead singer of the band and she's the drummer Mm -hmm. and, and really the balance (laughs) between those two. um, I, I feel like, the idea of futures and dream tanks also connects in methodologically and epistemologically because dream tanks uh, getting out, you know, you, you go into a think tank and everyone always told you sort of the terms of how you're supposed to think, you know, they'll say, Oh, we have to think about real estate today and capital and, Mm -hmm. and equity. We have to think about the dream tanks are, are that, that place of um, dreaming that is already undisciplined. You know, it takes place while we sleep. You know, it takes place outside the classrooms um, or maybe while we're daydreaming inside the classroom. And so what I like about Kalu and Teresa's, um, what, what, what is brought to IFI is, um, you know, like I think the sort of idea of dreaming at speeds faster than light, you know, there's like a type of time travel in Kalu's work. Like it's, it's both the same dreams as uh, ancestors who had the the top technology in the world when they voyaged the Pacific, uh, you know, a little less than a thousand years ago and, um, or began voyages. And, and then also, so dreams at the speeds faster than light. um, So imagining what the technology is doing now, what it could do in the future, what it has done in the past. um, And also the way we proceed, I think collectively at us at the speed of trust. So those two things are, you know, the, this, this, um, and I think Teresa really holds us accountable to that. Um, and so I think in terms of the cyborg work, I mean, just to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, Kalu has brought specifically Indigenous Futures Institute is, you know, IFI is, um, Kalu has like raised money to fund 20 to 30 teams of Indigenous Futurists, um, I don't want everyone listening to this podcast to hit us up for money, but, but you know, Kalu has, has done that and, and is creating this network. And we don't see ourselves, um, and Teresa articulates this, we're not in competition with other indigenous futurists or collectives, but rather always trying to be in conversation and networking and, 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 and sharing dreams, being influenced by other dreams. Uh, we mentioned Afrofuturists uh, earlier, uh, being influenced by Afrofuturism. Um, but I think that these, um, you know, Kalu is engaging things like synthetic biology, um, just, uh, it, you know, energy, um, energy sovereignty, climate change, climate adaptation. Whereas I think um, some of the stuff that Teresa is bringing, um, and these are not mutually exclusive, but is really, Teresa thinks about how indigenous people have always been trans-indigenous, have, have always had, um, forms of relationship building beyond, beyond the borders we know now, um, across oceans, across mountains, uh, across rivers. Um, and, and in Teresa's work, there's a focus on the, I don't want to call it the local, but it is, it is place-based. It is um, thinking about monuments, thinking about land education, thinking about unmapping um, settler geographies and cartographies, and, and think about the practicalities and pragmatism of existing forces such as institutions and in, in, in the management of land and imagining perhaps what is the next step? Is it co-management of land? Is it land back? What is it? So 
I, I feel like all that collective work is, is very cyborg. I don't know if other people would call it that, but, but that's definitely um, what influences even, even um, you know, my thinking. It's dirty work in that it's always been impure. And I think these colonial cartographies that we're in, such as Kailu talks a lot about Hawaii and like all the toxins, the, the waste, the nuclear waste in the Pacific, it's dirty, all the plastics. But, but there is a future, there is an indigenous future that is always emerging out of that, uh, out, out of all that waste. And I, I feel like um, that's a collective work. Um, and so I guess to, to answer your question, like I just, I, I don't even think of Kailu's work as, um, you know, as something to evaluate just as a, at an individual, in an individual way, an individual researcher, but really it's, it's how, how he connects to uh, scholars everywhere, indigenous, uh, futurists, whether they be scholars or not, um, in the past, present, and the future. Wow, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, Kalo, did you wanna jump in? Oh no, I just wanted to say that Wayne is way too kind. And mm -hmm. um, we're doing unprecedented things. To my knowledge, uh, I don't really know how many organizations are indigenous run and operated at the highest level of leadership and then handing out money and financial support and other types of support with this type of intention to other indigenous groups. Um, and I hope that we can continue to do this just because it's so effective. It's awesome to see and watch people manifest their dreams. Yeah, I mean, just the kind of leadership, I guess, to use a, a bit of a co-opted term, you know, it, it, it's about reclaiming that notion of leadership and making it, it sounds like more of a networked and non-hierarchical thing, uh, which is why I guess you express a certain humility there, but it's, you know, um, it's, it's, I think it's true that the, the, the specific kind of work that, you, you know, um, this hybrid sort of, you know, a commitment to technology, uh, you know, it, it really is representative of a, of a way out of this kind of neoliberal trap of kind of geoengineering our way out of the climate crisis, for example, right? Like trying to understand technology much more capaciously. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I wanted to, first of all, I wanted you to, I know you only have another five minutes, Teresa, so maybe I should um, direct the next, next question to you. I wanted to ask about your writing with Wayne about uh, land acknowledgements within the university, this kind of paternalistic, often kind of paternalistic gesture. You know, there's a moment in your Dear Native Students with Love essay where you, you talk about um, being celebrated uh, at this sort of convocation event and, and feeling this inherent tension, as you put it. And you ask, was the university applauding itself for graduating us? Did the university recognize how it continued to uphold and reinforce structures that kept our community out? Um, and then you you note the numbers, like over uh, you know over fifty four thousand total doctorates were conferred nationwide in the U.S. in two thousand seventeen, one hundred and twelve of which were awarded to American Indians. So I mean, those numbers sort of speak for themselves, and so this is why you feel this kind of tension. Um, and I wonder to what extent you you uh, you know in just like reflecting on your your essay with Wayne. Um, you know, feel that those numbers can materially change in the kind of gestural politics of acknowledging the kind of expropriation of land and resources that the university itself kind of represents. I mean, you know, in the Canadian context, you write about how um, there is this unique legal and political situation, and you talk about like some of the limitations to the ways in which land acknowledgements are, are given with this, within this kind of like legal framework and so on and even some of the like issues with the kind of normalizing or becoming hegemonic of land acknowledgements do you still see like any radical potential in them or is it it's just like it's up for debate no i think it's a really great question we really pull from and and look to first nation scholars um, who are at the helm of this critical discourse um, and it's really profoundly shaped, I would say, our, our Wayne and my writing together and how we're thinking through this. Um, and I also think, so to your question, right, about, um, about tensions with land acknowledgement, you know, can it forward Indigenous futures that like materially um, um, 
demonstrate or contribute to increased numbers of uh, enrollment and graduation. Um, it's kind of, oh, I, I molded your questions mm -hmm. together. Um, I, I would say um, the discourse right now, and it's really thanks to First Nation scholars um, in the U.S., is, is this really critical engagement with the adoption of land acknowledgement statements. Um, and scholars are really, scholars, practitioners, Indigenous people are really taking up this idea. It's not our idea of moving beyond the statement. Um, and how statements can materialize resources um, or actualize relationships with Native nations. And so I think institutions, settler institutions broadly, um, includes secondary, post-secondary education institutions, have a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. um, period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I, one of my former students, um, she often said, uh, institutions need to clean up their side of the street. Um, you know, that indigenous people are, are doing what they what they can do. And all, oftentimes a lot of blame is placed on us, um, but institutions need to do their part. And so I think, you know, my, I, my thinking is always very uh, pragmatic. Um, and so I do think that there is a lot that institutions can do. Um, part of that begins with just a general um, institutional assessment um, before, it, before an institution adopts a statement. Um, and this really came to my mind um, with our institution and thinking about their relationship with local Native people. Um, and then the adoption of rhetoric around wanting to do tribal engagement. Um, but when you really assess what is happening at our institution, there's a lot of harm uh, that's endured by these communities. Uh, the numbers are especially low in comparison to other UC system, UC's institutions. Um, graduation rates are abysmally low nationwide, but including um, the UC system. And so uh, just to answer your question, I, I do think that the conversation is changing in one that is especially critical to forward these material uh, commitments. Um, but, um, you know, that I think that's amongst a group of critical people, critical scholars, critical individuals, and how the institution takes that up might not necessarily be what we envision or what we advocate for mm -hmm. it just yeah it opens up a conversation but the conversation is not the whole thing like this is what you and wayne sort of write in the in the essay is that you know even even the notion of social justice practices is not it's not even adequate right like as you put it you know these are not indigenous practices and indeed our social justice dreams your social justice dreams may have different goals abolition decolonization inclusion and equity are not necessarily commensurable projects. Um, Wayne, did you wanna expand at all on um, uh, some of those ideas? No, I um, always learn so much in conversation with Teresa. Uh, I mean, just this idea of institutional assessment. Um, and um, I, I feel like, you know, that moves, be, that moves beyond in a different direction, which is uh, beyond just the land acknowledgement as, um, a rhetorical, uh, a something to phrase, right? Something mm -hmm. to write, but but actually a material process that should probably be engaged um, before before writing an acknowledgement. And it's just, I think that's really brilliant. Um, and I think that it's, um, but, you know, one thing that the land acknowledgement does is it it makes everybody wonder what what is it for and um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, what does it not do? I, I know that our own students really want to do one um, and very quickly wonder what it doesn't do. So I, so I think that I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the tension that most people are, seem to be feeling with the land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and to connect it to um, some of Kalu's research, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the land is this, you know, uh, prime concern. Well, here I'm quoting um, decolonization. It's not a metaphor that land is a prime concern for settler colonialism. Um, you know, this logic of terra nullius and, and extractivism, it drives the very kind of like uh, uh, spirit of settler supremacy. Um, you, you talk about how property law is a settler colonial technology uh, at one point. And, and I mean, so this is about the connecting, it sounds like land acknowledgements with ecology, right? Like trying to think about how these two things can inter intersect in order to invoke like a future of degrowth, 
in, in many ways. Um, you know, do you, Kayla, when you hear a land acknowledgement, are you, are you at all looking for those sorts of specific kind of radical gestures to um, deep ecology or, or uh, indigenous technology that is about, you know, not just a rhetorical appeal to stewardship of the land, but actually like transforming this death machine of global capitalism into something that is somehow sustainable? Great question. I, I feel as though sometimes land acknowledgements, depending on who it comes from, can be uh, hollow and sort of a, yeah, just kind of superficial. I want to see more taxation. I want to see mm. more, again, large scale land back initiatives. I find it sometimes funny um, I'm a, I was on an advisory group for the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and they were doing a land back uh, or doing a, a land acknowledgement. And then in the same week buying, you know, 600 acres of land in, in Kauai. Um, right. 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 And so, you know, there's a lot of that, like misdirection with one hand in a very superficial way and then not actually you know, operationalizing indigenous sovereignty and practice. There, and there's so many contradictions like that. Bill, Ga Bill Gates apparently owns more farmland than any individual in the United States and yet writes these books on like combating the climate crisis, you know, and, and so on. Um, it's like the hypocrisy is sickening. Right. Um, you know, and, and especially considering there is this like large scale war on nature um, that for, for those of us in this sort of like affluent global North is mostly invisibilized. I guess like, you know, I, I realize you probably, neither of you have much more time, but I, I wanted to ask about this contemporary kind of moment that we're in where not only the coronavirus pandemic, but now the war in Ukraine is making us differently aware of supply chains, the entanglement of these like, you know, intersecting spheres of global capitalism and so on. I mean, um, you know, Wayne, you gesture to the competing empires of the United States and the USSR at one point in a third university as possible um, and, and sort of try and think through, um, as you put it, how removing land from people also means making war ontologically inherent on certain peoples. Warable peoples in turn lead to bombable lands, extinctionable animals and genocide. Um, you know, how can we kind of infer from this contemporary moment just the urgency of not just demilitarization, but like decolonization? Like, how are these two things fundamentally linked? Well, I would love to just sort of give a specific example that we're dreaming about. Um, so, so Kalu um, in particular, um, but, but IFI, you know, we were working on this, 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 this concept of um, indigenous design hubs globally and how, how we could support the creation of indigenous design hubs globally. And this would be uh, you know, specific to place. Um, so if there was a hub in Hawaii, what, you know, what, what would be being considered under that design? Um, uh, you know, Kalu was definitely interested in energy sovereignty and land back as probably part of any such design hub, but you know, what would this look like differently in, in Kenya or in um, Taiwan or, or wh wherever? Um, but, you know, one thing we did was uh, in, in sort of writing up an uh, initial proposal, we were going to go after big funds for this, um, but um, we were collaborating with the, the bioregional, um, I can't remember what they're called, bioregional center here at UC San Diego. And these are folks in urban planning um, and uh, uh, like Keith Pizzoli. And, and really we love the idea of bioregional center because here um, the bioregion would be not San Diego. It would be, it would be more, most of Kumeyaay nation in a sense, like as a bioregion, which is also how indigenous people conceptualize land as, as, an, as, a, as a system of relations between living and non-living persons, uh, but not, not demarcated by these political boundaries. So, so it extends into, into um, what we call Mexico and uh, Baja Mexico and Tijuana. And so, so imagining indigenous design hubs is not located in 
nation states, but actually in in the in the in an ecological relationship that you know could be called the bioregion. So addressing a sort of what does it mean to design energy sovereignty or self-determination or bioregional sustainability um, between urban and non-urban areas in a very pragmatic way. Uh, and um, you know, what does it mean to uh, Kalu, obviously, from a Hawaiian perspective, is, when they're thinking about demilitarization, it's very literal, right? And it is very much connected to colonization, but also to energy and to toxicity and to health. And so, so, um, so not just simply demilitarization as in some kind of removal of troops or something like that. So uh, I think that, um, you know, we're hoping, again, dreaming beyond sort of the parameters in which we're told we're allowed to dream like we're allowed to conceptualize um so beyond simply a political uh a new policy or a new mi military policy or a new economic policy but but to think very very much interdisciplinary across these areas yeah and i think it opens on to like really radical solutions I mean, we're really dreaming about creating and distributing and decentralizing this type of innovation. And I think that would be an awesome end goal is to just create, you know, you know, opportunities for others where that type of thinking and forecasting is the norm. I think it's going to be really important. And what types of uh, technology and culture people bring into those new spaces will be incredible in terms of what they design and create and build. And that doesn't have to be like glistening, new, pretty IKEA catalog looking brushed aluminum buildings. I mean, this could be in the husk of colonialism in terms of dilapidated sugar mills or, you know, Red Hill fuel tank jet fuel tank refinery in Hawaii or other other places all over the world where there are these like remnants of and this hangover of colonialism and militarism where that industrial pollution is just left to rot. And I think in that husk of colonialism, we will see a lot of these new forms of innovation that actually impact our communities. It, it literally will be reduce, reuse, recycle those structures and what we repurpose them into will be beautiful ultimately. Um, I, I don't have, I mean, I have a million other things that I could ask you both, um, but you know, I'll just say like, uh, this, is, this has been um, incredibly just like illuminating for me in terms of thinking, not just theoretically, in terms of like, these are the terms that we use because they're fashionable but actually thinking about them again, material ways that um, to use the, the terminology of your book, Wayne, like a fourth university is emerging or gestating in the first that while you're, you know, seeking funds and, and trying to build uh, collective power and support that power with capital, you are also thinking about ways to sabotage and subvert the the community community to school pipeline financial systems uh the neoliberal kind of death machine that you know is leading to this this sixth mass extinction um so i mean it's just it's such inspiring work and and thank you both um and teresa who had to leave early for for making the time to talk to me thank you scott thanks uh you know we we're we're chatting it up full of so much admiration for how well read you are and how thoughtful you are. Or, um, we, I think we got a lot out of this ourselves because we don't actually get a lot of time to talk at this level with each other. Um, so, so this was really great. Yes, thank you so much, Scott. You're, you read so much in, in such depth and we just really appreciate the opportunity.